I'm going to sort of slow down the pace a bit uh, during the first couple of slides to define some terms and then move on to uh, how you can uh, evolve an architecture uh, in an iterative fashion as you go along, just like you would typically do uh, with software development. So we have this notion that uh, if you take a look at a lot of architecture uh, literature, uh, you get a metaphor that software architecture is like a blueprint for a house. And when you compare and contrast a software architecture, it's uh, a bit different than uh, a blueprint because a blueprint for a house is hard to change and software is very easy to change. So uh, do any of you have any uh, the software architect in your title? Can I have a show of hands? OK. So I get uh, teased from my friends time to time saying that now all, all I do is uh, sit and create PowerPoint. So anyway, so even uh, Dilbert doesn't like software architects. So it says, uh, so architects uh, doesn't have a lot of uh, good vibe from the rest of the developers. So metaphor for an architect, I like this definition uh, much better. So you define an architect, software architect, as a gardener or a tour guide. That's an amazing talk by Eric Donenberg. Uh, that's titled Architecture Without Architects. I uh, highly encourage you to uh, watch that uh, talk. So just like a tour guide, architect knows how to uh, show best places to see, uh, like if you compare it with a, a safari tour guide, best places to show uh, people to see birds and so on. So then what is software architecture? Again, as this uh, uh, cartoon uh, defines, uh, it says, uh, what is this uh, green and yellow and blue boxes? And you say it's a bunch of rectangles. So I like this definition better than the previous one. So this one is defined by uh, Martin Fowler. So I'm going to quote Martin Fowler a lot. Uh, so he defines the highest level breakdown of a system into its parts, the decisions that are hard to change, and there are multiple architectures in a system, and what, what's architecturally significant can change uh, over time. So what's the highest level breakdown of a system? So highest level breakdown uh, can uh, look something like this. So this is uh, WC2's uh, reference architecture for IoT. As you can see, we have a portal, dashboard, uh, API management, uh, event processing, uh, and so on. And uh, decisions uh, that are hard to change. So in a typical project, uh, if you take a look at the programming language choice, that's very hard to change. And DB schema again, that's again very hard to change. Uh, infrastructure uh, and also monitoring solution. So programming language, if you work with, if your team is uh, Java developers, it will be very hard to change and adapt to a new uh, programming uh, language. Uh, you do have certain tools that help you to do DB schema migration, uh, but in general, it's still hard to change. And there, are, there can be multiple architectures uh, for a given system. So there can be a solution architecture that uh, show you the structure and how the overall pieces fit together. Uh, integration architect architecture, how the integration is done between components. Uh, security architecture, what's your security uh, policies and uh, what's the, the, uh, the security, how, how security is defined in your system. And application architecture, how the application is structured and also uh, component architecture. So there can be multiple architectures, but it's uh, not limited to this, there can be more. And what's architecturally significant uh, at one point can change over time. So if you look at uh, DB choice, that can uh, change. Uh, so we worked with uh, one uh, customer who uh, came to us with the problem and said uh, they have to use a NoSQL database because uh, uh, they have a lot of high throughput of, uh, they have high, uh, very large files coming in 
and uh, have to insert records uh, into database and uh, uh, process them. So at first, uh, we were also uh, sort of optimistic, and we uh, tackled it on. And it turned out to be the wrong solution, and it, we had a lot of problems uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, Cassandra. Uh, so at, at that time, uh, the customer also didn't have a dedicated team of people to manage and monitor Cassandra. So nodes were going down. So we uh, learned a lot about, lot about uh, Cassandra. You need to have uh, uh, four nodes to tolerate one node failure and uh, all these uh, technical uh, uh, problems that we didn't anticipate uh, beforehand. And infrastructure can also change. Uh, so I am working with a customer right now who is uh, deployed solely on top of uh, AWS, and they are tied to a lot of AWS uh, services. And uh, now they are trying to move it to uh, another hosting provider. That hosting provider does not have all the Amazon uh, capabilities. So that is, again, uh, our significance of uh, deployment can change uh, over time. So why uh, do, you, do you have to spend time on a software architecture? So I like this diagram. Uh, so this, again, uh, I'm quoting from uh, Martin Fowler. So if you look at the blue line, uh, blue line starts with uh, starts very fast. That is, uh, you are, you are doing no design. So the y-axis is cumulative functionality, and the x-axis is uh, time. So at first, when you are doing no design, you are able to churn out features much faster. And uh, if you look at the uh, red line, uh, you are doing upfront design, and even though uh, the, the, ch the feature churn rate is much slower. As you progress along, it, uh, it's easy to add uh, features. So having an evolved or iterative approach uh, to the software architecture is, uh, again, important. So if you look at uh, today's enterprises, they are uh, very complex. So you probably have seen uh, a diagram like this uh, before. So why enterprise systems are, uh, have, have become so complex? So over time, uh, developers and team structure can change. And also, uh, you acquire a lot of uh, features. You acquire different uh, solutions. You integrate different solutions, which add to the complexity uh, of the system. So I worked with a project uh, at a customer. So we are working with a sort of an augmented approach. We go on site, work with their team uh, to uh, develop and uh, design uh, their solution. So at one time, uh, their team structure changed. And also, the person who worked on a piece of uh, software that uh, provided functionality like uh, S3, uh, so you can store files and retrieve files, uh, so moved on. So then when a new person came, he didn't have the context and expertise to go uh, sort of dive in and solve uh, problems uh, in, as the original developer. So from the planning stage, we have to plan, uh, saying that uh, it will take longer for that, that person to fix, uh, add fixes, and uh, do uh, development on that, which affected all the other teams that were involved in the project. And there is also this mindset, if something is, work, something is working, you don't have to change it. So the problem is when, when you have new requirements, then you, you will be finding ways to incorporate that change without changing what's working right now, which again adds to the complexity. Uh, so in an idealistic scenario for managing th this complexity, uh, autonomic uh, computing is uh, introduced by IBM that uh, have self-configuring self-healing, uh, self-optimizing, and self-protecting uh, uh, software, uh, which I don't think any of you have any kind of system uh, close to this. So we still have a long way uh, to go in that uh, regard. Uh, so other approach to managing complexity is to follow this simple uh, algorithm. So you write down the problem, think really hard, and you write down the solution. So this is true if and only if you are uh, Richard uh, Feynman. 
So Feynman uh, pioneered uh, quantum computing, and also he uh, introduced a lot of concepts in uh, nanotechnology. So he's, he's, it's a, a code that's uh, usually attributed to uh, Feynman. So practically, it, uh, managing complexity is uh, an ongoing uh, challenge. And we all know this. Uh, Fred Brooks uh, said it in 1986, uh, there is no silver bullet. Uh, so and each and every organization and each and every people who work in a project uh, are different. So one solution for managing complexity you applied in one organization might not suit uh, another organization. And complexity uh, can arise in multiple stages. So within software development, uh, you can arise complexity. And at the deployment operation stage, you encounter uh, complexity. And the ongoing uh, maintenance phase. Also, when you need to do bug fixes, when you need to add uh, new features, uh, augment uh, new uh, components, uh, you uh, encounter complexity. So again, Fred Brooks uh, have told us that over 90% of cost happened during our software maintenance phase, which is uh, very true. And uh, we have seen that this is true happening uh, in multiple uh, places, multiple clients, multiple uh, uh, deployments. Uh, so then came uh, a bunch of people got together and uh, put, up the, put up this uh, Agile manifesto. And uh, they uh, basically uh, sort of, uh, in order to manage complexity, OK, you can't manage it, uh, you can't plan it. So let's have like an iterative uh, approach. So you value individuals and interactions over process and tools. You have working software, customer collaboration, uh, responding uh, to change. So if you look at the uh, traditional waterfall method, you analyze your requirements, design code, integration, test, and deploy. So there's no overlap between uh, any of the phases. Uh, so Scrum is one method of doing uh, agile deployment uh, or agile uh, methodology, following the Agile methodology. Uh, in one iteration, you do uh, all this. You uh, design, require, uh, you plan, and then you evolve, and then uh, deploy. So before coming into that, so there are uh, multiple frameworks and multiple methods of doing uh, uh, Agile development. Uh, how many of you here do some kind of Agile development right now? OK. So any of you are familiar with this? Anyone's doing scale agile? I don't see any hands. So this scale agile framework is, uh, again, a new, uh, or I, don't, I, would, I would not say new, but uh, uh, a framework that's uh, designed for large uh, teams. So I'm working with a customer that's uh, doing uh, scale agile for the last uh, uh, two and a half years or so, and they, uh, that uh, has worked incredibly well uh, for their scale. Uh, and their teams. So Scale Agile, again, uh, have, uh, have, uh, ac have received a lot of uh, criticism uh, from uh, different people saying that, OK, this is not what Agile means. This means that we are going back to waterfall method again. Uh, so that uh, criticism came from uh, Ken Schwaber, who uh, originally introduced a Scrum, Scrum methodology. But I see relevant good parts uh, from scale agile methodology, like uh, we have our architecture epics in each release uh, before doing uh, at the release planning stage. You have uh, architecture epic. So epic is like a, a large activity that, that will span multiple uh, sort of sprints uh, in a development uh, cycle. And you can see the, uh, the red box uh, represent an architecture epic. And a uh, good thing in the framework itself, they uh, mentioned that architecture evolves continuously. So it continuously support uh, an evolving uh, architecture, we see, which is uh, very good. And uh, during the Scrum uh, methodologies, uh, we get a lot of uh, changes that uh, go back to the architecture, and that is handled in a controlled way. So I see that, see that as a very good point, and uh, I have seen that work uh, in a good way. So I, you know, so I'm borrowing a couple of slides from uh, Andy, who did a keynote yesterday uh, about the West solution to do iterative uh, 
uh, iteratively improving an architecture. So he started with uh, uh, very few servers, yeah, ESB application and data services, and as you go along, you add uh, capability. So this architecture uh, is a good example of uh, you design or you plan uh, whatever, what you want in the entire solution, and then uh, iteratively building uh, that architecture. And so there are cases that uh, you don't know uh, the end. You don't know what the end architecture is going to be, and uh, that is okay. You can start small, and then uh, add uh, as you go along. So this example is uh, uh, again well, from experience at uh, from a custom experience where they had a platform uh, deployed on Docker, and uh, for in order so. They are giving this platform to uh, different business groups uh, to be able to use and adapt and uh, uh, develop on. So there, they had to integrate uh, with and uh, with a legacy uh, authenticated uh, solution that they uh, had inside their uh, business uh, unit. So there, we were able to implement a custom uh, user store manager which uh, handles the authentication. Uh, and uh, do that integration in uh, one uh, sprint. And so this is an inter interim change that uh, they wanted to make in order to prove that this is uh, viable and it, it has business value uh, before giving that solution uh, to, the, to that business uh, unit. And so this, this, is, this change, even though it's uh, interim, we are going to make uh, that go away in the next uh, iterations and onboard those applications onto the platform uh, itself. Uh, so here I'm showing the uh, end architecture of uh, a typical uh, solution. So by looking at the some some sometimes by looking at the end architecture, you wouldn't uh, so you, you can't get guess the uh, end architecture. So this is a deployment diagram. So I'll show the. A development uh, sort of uh, thinking uh, behind it. So you, this is like a uh, in, in a um, banking solution, the account open functionality. It started with uh, one uh, service running on one uh, container. So I'm using container in a loose sense. It doesn't mean a Docker container here. It started as a one uh, service running on one uh, container, uh, and then uh, we scale up that layer uh, independently, and we introduced uh, an uh, integration hub and exposed uh, a, the service as the version one service. Then uh, in the third iteration, we scale up the integration hub itself uh, to have higher, higher availability. And then in, in the fourth iteration, we introduced another version of the service, and that version uh, handles a uh, message uh, message format changes in the integration hub itself. So we don't even have any changes in the actual uh, service. Uh, and in the fifth iteration, we had introduced multiple, uh, uh, the third iteration of, third version of the service, which was hosted in a separate uh, set of uh, containers. Uh, so my take takeaway that I want to give you from this is that uh, it's OK if you, if you uh, don't know what the end architecture is going to be, uh, you can uh, iteratively improve as you go along. And it's uh, especially uh, important that during the development cycle, the arch architectural changes that you, uh, that you would encounter, uh, incorporate those into the uh, end architecture and uh, make uh, changes uh, uh. So that's all I have. Uh,